This is the Value Investor Podcast with Tracy Reinick. All things value, all the time. Welcome back, value investors. So how long should you own a stack? This question has come up recently, and we know Warren Buffett, the head of uh, the value investing kingdom, has said the best time to sell a stack is never. He believes in long-term investing, and we do too as value investors. But what exactly does that mean? Is it five years? Is it 10, 20? Is it even more than that? Recently, the Berkshire portfolio has been trading more than it has been holding long term. I don't know if you've noticed, but remember in late 2020, it bought some shares of Chevron. So that was during the first year of the pandemic, bought some shares of Chevron after the vaccine was announced, but it sold a big chunk of them a quarter later in 2021. We talked about that on the podcast. Then it ended up buying even more shares of Chevron in early 2022. Now, it was such a huge chunk of shares. We now know that was Warren Buffett himself ordering that trade with the cash on hand. But they've recently sold a bunch of that Chevron uh, stock. We don't know if some of this was some that remained from the original buys or if this was even Buffett himself selling some. So it went from almost 10% of the Berkshire portfolio to 6.7% after those sales last quarter. So if best time to sell is never, why, why is even Chevron being sold right now? It's not like crude is at 30 or $40. It's still above 70. And Berkshire has, you know, over $100 billion in cash sitting there. So it's not like Warren himself had, he wanted to buy something else, so he needed to find some cash. So he was going to sell part of this big position, which it was a big p- position in Chevron, to get some of that cash. No, he has all the cash sitting there. He doesn't need to do that. Or, again, was it the lieutenants getting out of their original position in Chevron? So remember, it was probably the lieutenants who bought in late 2020, and then they sold some of it, but not the entire position in 2021. So maybe this latest sales was them needing the cash because they have different cash allocation than Buffett himself does. Another thing that they also recently sold was all of the RH holding, and that had only been in the portfolio for a couple of years. And then we know about some of the other quick sales, like at least the Taiwan Semi, that was Warren Buffett, bought one quarter, sold the next quarter, and it was a big position, or a couple billion dollars. I would call that somewhat big. It wasn't as big for the overall portfolio, but it was several billion dollars. And then that was gone. And then Buffett only just said it was because of the geopolitics, and he was concerned about that. So what is going on with when should you sell a stock, right? Because even Warren Buffett has been selling stocks. So recently, someone on Twitter posted a list of Warren Buffett's 10 longest held stocks. Uh, The oldest one and his longest held position is Coca-Cola, ticker KO. It's now been 35 years The little chart that was posted said 34, so that must be a year old, that little chart now. It's 35 years. It was bought in 1988. It's still uh, the fifth largest position because Occidental has really jumped up there, and it looks like Occidental is about third now. So this puts the Coke position in the fifth largest position, and Berkshire now owns 9% of Coca-Cola, of the company. The second largest holding, and that's been 29 or almost 30 years now, is American Express, ticker AXP. And then the third longest was Moody's, ticker MCO. I had to go look at the list of the Berkshire portfolio because I didn't even remember that they owned Moody's. (laughs) And so I had to go look and see, like, when, when did they get that? And this was in the first quarter of 2001. It's the ninth largest uh, holding in Berkshire. 
and they've owned that for 22 years now. Um, another one on the list was Procter & Gamble, ticker PG. They bought that in the first quarter of 2005. So that's been 18 years and it's up. Uh, yeah, so that one's pretty long. But um, some of these, uh, you know, I was kind of looking around to see, well, how how well have they been doing since he bought them? And, you know, 34 years, that's a real long time. And to have it be such a large position in the portfolio. Now, we know when he bought it in 1988, Buffett was a huge fan of Coca-Cola. He famously said he drinks like five or six cans a day. And I don't know if he still does. It's been a while since, you know, he's talked about the Coke addiction thing that he kind of has. But um, maybe he does still. I'm not sure. Um, but so he was a user of the product. He likes to buy companies where he uses the product. That makes sense. But I plugged this into a chart and I went off of June 1st, 1988 as my date to start because I don't know what quarter it was he bought. And apparently he bought like a bunch during that whole year of 1988. And he has, I guess, added somewhat to his position a little bit later, but we'll just start in, on June 1st, 1988. And then I look through July 11th, 2023. So I plug it into like Yahoo Finance and their charts to give me you know, what the total return was. And I see this huge number pop up. But I didn't realize that I had an old search still on there. And like on my comparisons, it, it does keep it on Yahoo Finance. It'll keep your old comparisons on even if you put in a new ticker. And that old comparison was with Microsoft. So I see this huge number pop up and I'm like, oh my gosh, Coke has done better than I thought. And then I realized it's Microsoft that really did better. So Coke for that time period over the 34 years was up 2,420%. So that's not too bad. A thousand dollars invested. This is without the dividends would have been $24,000 um, approximately all these years later. The S and P 500 was up 1,605%. So that it has been beating the S and P 500. Both of these are without any dividends. And Coke does pay a nice dividend. It's yielding 3.1% right now. And it is uh, has steadily been paying the dividends. So that's a nice little added return that over all those years would compound as well. So your return is actually much more than 2,420%. But I think I've talked about this in the past when I've looked it up. Coke does not have one of those historic investment calculators on its site unfortunately so we can't plug it all in there like we can with microsoft and some others that have the historic calculator where you can compound it with the dividends in there uh, but microsoft and that uh, enormous number i saw during that same period was up eighty three thousand six hundred and seventy five percent so one of those stocks did very well coke it is beating the s p 500 but microsoft was the lottery winner during that same 34 year period, $1,000 invested in Microsoft would have been $836,000. $10,000 would have been $8.36 million during that time period. So um, nothing wrong with what Coke has done, but Microsoft really hit it out of the ballpark. So I had to get Microsoft off the chart so I could keep looking at some of these. So then I looked at um, American Express and that was from 1994. And I don't know again on that one, what time of the year. So I also went off of June 1st, 1994 through July 11th, 2023. And uh, American Express, ticker AXP, was up 2,066%. The S&P 500 was up only 175%. Wow, that's because the, the bear market there, right? After the dot-com bust. And then we had the Great Recession and that like, really hurt returns for the S&P 500. But I did compare it on that one, even though I had wiped Microsoft off of there, I did look up, uh, you know, one of the big winners from the 1990s, which was Cisco. 
just out of curiosity, if you had bought Cisco in 1994, it went public in like 1990, I believe, and was the best performing stock of the 90s. But then it it hasn't been. So what what has Cisco done the last 29 years? And it's up 3,590%. So it's, you know, it is beating American Express, but both American Express and Cisco still beating the S&P 500 during that time period. So that's not too bad. Um, then I did take a look at Moody's. So Moody's, the one that you forget that they own, ticker M as in Mary, C-O, M-C-O, 22 years, he's owned it. Um, and that one up 2,122% versus the S&P 500 up 257.9%. Again, those 2,000s during bear markets, it pays to be a stock picker. The indexes usually don't perform well during bear markets. And so the way to outperform is to be the picker. And as long as you are like Buffett and you pick correctly, like he picked Moody's, then, um, you know, you're doing okay. But someone did want to ask when this was all being discussed on Twitter, what happened to all the other stocks from the early 2000s? Because uh, literally after Moody's, it drops down to stocks that, uh, you know, like Procter and Gamble. So Procter and Gamble, he bought in the first quarter, but 2005. So that's just 18 years. He's owned that one and it's up 148%. The S and P 500 is up 278.8% during the same period. So in this case, the S and P 500 is actually beating it starting in 2005. And I went on the last trading day of the month. Uh, in March for the first quarter, because all we know is first quarter 2005. Um, So Procter & Gamble hasn't been that great for him for the last 18 years. He's still in it. He's not selling it, but why not? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is, you know, meeting his goals at all. Um, PE is 23.4. So it's not cheap right now. It might have been when he bought it originally in 2005, but you kind of wonder on a stock that is lagging even just the index over, you know, a period of time, what, what is the catalyst to have it not lag? What, where's the growth going to come from? What's going to, what's going to change? And right now, all we know is it's not a cheap stock here, so it's not going to, you know, it's not being ignored by the market because it's trading at 23 times. So he does own some of these stocks that kind of, you know, haven't been doing that much. And he has stayed in these. Another one, when I was kind of just looking around the portfolio that is starting to get a little intriguing now is the Amazon purchase. Remember, he bought that in the first quarter of 2019. And everyone was shocked because it wasn't cheap, (laughs) wasn't a value stock on normal metrics, right? And then Buffett went to the annual meeting and he had to, you know, reassure everyone that there's something that's a value about it. He's been told by one of the lieutenants, he never told us which one bought it, but one of the lieutenants bought it was not him. And he was told and, you know, they discussed it or something and there's some value there. But since then, they haven't sold any and they haven't added to it. So it's just kind of sitting there. But now he's owned it over four four years now. So that's getting a little longer than some of the length of time that he's owned some of these other investments recently. So since uh, March 31st, 2019, like at the end of that quarter there, uh, Amazon's up 33.5%. The S&P 500 is up 51.8 during that time period. So over those four years, buying the expensive Amazon, but it might not have been expensive. We don't know. Apparently, there was some value there. So it's still in the portfolio after all. Then it hasn't been performing that well compared to some of the other investments Um, but that's an interesting one to watch because we have had all the selling recently. So again, the 
going back to the question of what happened in the early 2000s, why why aren't there many other stocks that are of bigger length of time in the portfolio? You know, he only has basically these three that are over 20 years now. And there's, you know, 45, 50 positions in the Berkshire portfolio. So there's kind of this myth that, you know, he buys and holds forever, but but if you actually look at the portfolio, he's he's not actually doing that. And we know this from even just some of the trades that have happened in just the last couple of years. So the early 2000 stocks did happen to be a lot of his banks. Uh, we've talked about this on prior podcasts before he sold them all off, but I believe he did buy like Wells Fargo in early 2000s, either 2000 or 2001. Um, he's owned like a couple of those other banks that many of which he's really reduced his position on and is almost out of, or he's totally out of them now. Some of the more regional banks, because remember a couple of years ago, over 55% of the portfolio was in banks and or finance, which includes like insurance and American express. So he really, that was not working for him and he had to get, you know, out of those. So the question is. When when do you sell? How do you know when to sell? Um, you know this this kind of myth of Buffett saying the time to sell is never. That that seems like you know that's not the case as we now can see. Even just looking at his portfolio, he doesn't follow the rule himself. And really, the time to sell is if something is not working in your strategy anymore. So obviously he doesn't believe it's the time to sell Procter & Gamble, even though it's underperforming the S&P 500. Whatever's going on in the business must be what he targeted and what he looks for. So um, he just deciding to stay in there. Similarly, whatever was going on with RH and they decided to get out of that completely, that must not be you know, following the strategy they wanted anymore either. So they decided to get out of that. Same with Taiwan Semi, um, to some extent, a little bit with Chevron now too. Someone did sell some more Chevron last quarter. And so that must mean that it's not following whatever strategy and or they needed the cash somehow. And so they decided to sell some of that. We don't really know. We're not privy to the investment discussions, obviously. We only find out through Buffett interviews and the annual meetings. So really as an investor, you always do have to know what's going on. Buffett has said on IBM, he decided to sell it because it was no longer going in the direction he thought it was gonna go in. So he just got out, even though he took a loss on that stock. Um, you sell it and you move on. And he did move on to Apple and that's, that worked out for him, right? So always make sure you are watching what your company is doing. Know where the growth is coming from. Know what's happening with management. Know if that management is going to take the company where you think it's going to go. Owning a stock for 10, 20, 30 years means a lot is going to change in that business, right? Even with Coca-Cola, when he bought it in 1988, it was, you know, reigning supreme in the brand consciousness. It was sponsoring the Olympic Games and the Olympic athletes, which it still partially does as well. But it was riding high then. It's 34 years later, still a great brand. But there's no guarantees that that was going to be the case. But it still is giving Buffett what he is looking for. Um, let's see, what is it trading at? It's trading at about 23 times. So it's not cheap right here. A lot of these uh, consumer products companies, they have uh, had big rallies in the last couple of years. It's kind of seen as a little bit of a safety play, and now they are kind of pricey. But Buffett has never gotten out of a stock because the valuation went, you know, a lot higher. He's only just not gotten in a stock if the valuation has been higher, with the exception of Amazon. Um, but he says there's some value there with Amazon. But it'll be interesting to see as we move forward 
is Amazon just being held because it is kind of a core type of holding like a Visa or MasterCard, which got very expensive, but those stocks have done well for the Berkshire portfolio. Um, Amazon right now is not, but that doesn't mean it won't in the future. So maybe they're giving it a little bit more leeway than they did with some of the others like IBM and some of the others. Um, we don't know, but these are all questions you need to be asking yourself when you're thinking about how long should I own a stock? When do I sell it? And um, those are difficult questions because, uh, you know, Buffett kind of just, you know, he'll buy. And then if he sells quickly, like he did with Taiwan Semi, that's very unusual. If he does, then that's because something definitely has changed. And in his mind, it was apparently the geopolitics, the um, Ukraine war, perhaps, and made him think twice about being invested in Taiwan. So these are all things you should keep in mind as a value investor. But even Warren Buffett, who is a long term investor, hasn't really been that long term on most of his holdings. So that's a lesson there too for all of us that you really shouldn't just be buying and then blindly just holding on for as long as you want. So keep that in mind. Let me recap the stock tickers here. Um, Procter & Gamble is PG. Coca-Cola is KO. Moody's, MCO. American Express, AXP and Amazon, A-M-Z-N. I think those are the main ones we talked about. Um, And as always, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And you can get us on Apple, of course, and Spotify. And I'll be back next week with some more Value Stacks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.